Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today, break it down. News of the day, my dear friend and brother, Ricky Smiley, host of the Ricky Smiley Morning Show, actor, comedian, author, and extraordinary human being. Should be a fascinating breakdown. Top story of the day, Herschel Damn Walker. <laughs> the election is today, state of Georgia. US Senate runoff. Well, the bigots who are voting for Herschel Walker, they are literally wearing um, outfits, hats, shirts that say, run, Herschel, run. Here's some of it. Herschel represents the, uh, the state I wanna live in, the way I wanna live my life, his values, and I, um, I really believe he will represent Georgians, not represent Joe Biden. Well, here's the thing, it, it's such a double standard and that's what Democrats do. They're complaining about him forcing someone to get an abortion, but they're pro-choice, so it makes no sense. And that's what Democrats do, they like to spin things just to make it look evil or this. I don't know if he did it or not, you know, the bottom line is he's the right choice. I mean, you see the hypocrisy here. According to those who are still supporting Herschel Walker, uh, the Democrats are the ones who are wrong for calling out the hypocrisy of Herschel Walker as it relates to basically everything. Now remember, I've said this before, in order to keep themselves from having to challenge their own values, what they will do is move the moral compass so they never have to actually hold anyone accountable to any behavioral standard. This is a sad, sad state of affairs for Republicans. You all have gone from the black Republican Colin Powell at one time to Herschel Walker, all right? Okay, now I have a whole lot of lies to go through because Herschel did a whole lot of talking. Let me first start with this one because as you may know, Herschel Walker, actually is not a resident of Georgia. He committed two crimes, one in Georgia, another one in Texas. Let me highlight the ways, here it is. I was sitting in my home in Texas and I was seeing what was going on in this country. But during a campaign rally just hours ago, Walker claimed that he's always been a Georgia resident. I represent the great people of Georgia. I've lived here my whole life. Walker has been under fire over this already, fending off questions about his residency after CNN's K-File reported that Walker was getting a Texas tax break intended for a primary residence. Okay, let's go ahead and count the ways here. Uh, so Herschel Walker said in one context, he was sitting at his home in Texas when he got the call to run for the US Senate in Georgia. And then he tells another crowd, I've lived in Georgia my entire life. That's called a pathological liar, something that his campaign executive has already said. The man is a pathological liar. Now, here's another dynamic. You see, Herschel Walker should actually be under criminal investigation by both the state of Texas and the state of Georgia. Why is that? Because he claimed homestead exemption tax in the state of Texas. Two years in a row, both of those years were after he announced he was running for the US Senate. Remember, what does homestead exemption mean? It means you're going to receive a tax break for the home you own. By law, you can only take this tax break at your primary residential location. Texas law prohibits this under their criminal code, which means if you took the exemption, that's where you live. The state of Georgia has a very similar law. In addition to that, once Herschel Walker decided to register in the state of Georgia, however, by maintaining his residency in Texas, he committed another crime in the state he's running for Senate in. Has anyone put him under criminal investigation? No. Has he had to even answer these questions in a thoughtful conversation or interview? No. As a matter of fact, his campaign has a new rule now. Anyone who is a member of the press cannot get within 20 feet of Herschel Walker. Why is that? Because Herschel may actually try to answer a question. That is why. Let me give you some background. Um, polling suggests, all right? Polling suggests that Democratic uh, Senator Raphael Warnock, dear friend of mine, heads into this runoff. 
with a slight advantage over Herschel Walker, the Republican nominee. Senator Warnock leads by 1.9 percentage points in the 538's aggregate of publicly available polls and by nearly four points in the real clear politics polling average. In several surveys, Senator Warnock's support has topped the crucial 50% mark. While no recent poll shows um, Herschel Walker has ever topped over 50%. Do not buy into those numbers too much. As I've continued to say, polls are not predictions. And all of the polling data is within the margin of error. So if the margin of error is 3.9% to 4.8%, and that is the difference between the two. That means basically you could throw the poll away. That's what it means. It is a toss up. Nobody can claim clear victory. There's more. Herschel Walker doesn't know what he's actually running for. Here's a direct quote. Herschel Walker said, and I quote, they're not less motivated because they know right now that the House, yeah, he said the House, not the Senate, that the House will be even. So they don't want to understand what is happening right now. He says Saturday about Georgia voters. He goes on to say, you get the House, you get the committees, you get all the committees even. They just stall things within there. Ladies and gentlemen, that is verbatim. Some people thought when I first made that statement that somehow I was, I don't know, editing the statement. No, that is his actual statement. The man thinks he's running for the House of Representatives. He actually said in another interview that the late John Lewis was a US Senator. The man is the Republican nominee for the US Senate and could actually win today. There's more in a September interview with black media outlet rolling out where I happen to be the president of. Walker said that while some people only talk about him in reference to his past as a football star, he says, I've been very fortunate in the business world. I've been very fortunate in the military uh, career that I was doing a lot of things in the military. Ladies and gentlemen, the journalist who did that interview is a dear friend of mine. She works for Rolling Out Magazine. The man said what he said. Here's the fact. The fact is Walker has never, never served in the US military. Rather, he has worked as a paid spokesman for a for profit company that runs a mental health program for service members and veterans. While Walker has visited numerous military bases to discuss mental health and other issues, it's misleading at best and really just false to refer to a military career or to claim that he did anything in the military. And the outfit he worked for, extremely problematic among the ranks of those who served in the US military because they did not provide the service they proclaimed. Herschel Walker was exactly who he is today for them, a paid spokesperson, nothing more. All right, when rolling out, I posed a question to Walker about his false 2019 insinuation that he had been an FBI agent. Walker said, and I quote, I'm so glad you brought that up. Because if you look at the tape, when I talk about the FBI, you can clearly see I was joking. But I have trained with the FBI. That was his exact answer to Rolling Out Magazine. Here are the facts. It's possible that some listener might have thought Walker was joking. That is possible that somebody said, you know what, this has to be a joke. When he strongly suggested he had been an FBI agent. But Walker did not make that unambiguous. And in June 2022, when the Atlanta Journal Constitution reported about that comment, him being in the FBI, it was a serious claim. Walker's campaign did not tell the newspaper that he was simply making a joke. Also, when Walker told the same story in a 2017 speech, he claimed to have And I quote, FBI clearance, that's what he said. There's more. When the Atlanta Journal Constitution wrote in June about Walker's comment about having been an agent, the Walker campaign pointed to the newspaper, pointed the newspaper to a 1989 article 
in which Walker said he spent a week at FBI Training Academy in Quantico at the tail end of his football career. A claim the FBI has decided not to comment on. Walker has never in his life had a job in law enforcement. He has publicized a card showing that he was at some point after 2004 named an honorary agent and special agent or special deputy of the Cobb County Georgia Sheriff's Office. The titles that do not confer arrest authority. And here's something else he did. Remember that infamous debate where he pulled out a badge? Well, I actually did some research on that badge. He pulled out a badge from a county that was not even in question. So he got some sheriff in the state of Georgia to give him a badge right before the debate so that he can use a prop and say that he is still the police. Listen, the badge is legitimate as the Fisher Price badge when it comes to policing. That's it, it's fake, it's false. But what's the real issue here? The real issue is that Walker is a man who lacks identity. You have an individual who was at the top of his game for football, world renowned, honored, praised, respected by groups all across the planet. That wasn't enough for him. He had to lie and say he graduated valedictorian from his high school. He had to lie and say he finished his undergrad degree at the University of Georgia. He had to lie and say that he was pro, pro life when the fact is he was simply pro lying, nothing more. You're dealing with an individual who doesn't know who the hell he is. You see, Senator Warnock at least believes in something. The individuals who are voting for Herschel Walker, they don't believe in Herschel. They believe he will sit his ass down to do exactly what he's told, nothing else. All right, Ricky, thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> that's a big problem. Uh, I ran in. I ran into Herschel Walker at the grocery store, at the Tom Thumb grocery store in the cereal aisle in Dallas. Wow! And uh, so I'm a living witness to know that he was living there. He lived not far from me. I would often run into him. Amazing! In the grocery store, and he definitely have integrity issues and issues with telling. Um, you know, we're telling the truth, and uh, and back to your point, he definitely should be investigated because had that been me or you, uh, we were under investigation uh, uh, right now and probably in jail. Yep. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm I'm just embarrassed. I was embarrassed when I saw him sitting in between Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham as if he could not articulate or whatever. And the reason they're probably keeping the press from him because when they uh, they are afraid that if the press Ask him who he's gonna vote for. He's definitely gonna say Raphael Warnock. <laughs> <laughs> that that would take the cake. But listen, man. Listen, I don't I don't yeah. put it past the guy to do that. All right. Okay. Uh, obviously, the election is today. Those in Georgia, make sure you vote. Um, a slumlord as described by a tenant, decided to enlist a drug dealer to push an elderly man out of his apartment. Let's put up the picture of this dear brother. Atlanta Blackstar did a great job on this story. Francis Roberts, an elderly New York man, says he is being forced to live in dangerous and unbearable conditions as he is harassed by another tenant who has invited drug use and created a homeless encampment at the entrance of the Brooklyn apartment he has lived in for 20 years. Now this is really diabolical. I'm going to give you some significant background to this to show how this has created significant issue in this community. Roberts, who's 77 years of age, believes that the other tenant in his Crown Heights brownstone is working with the building's landlord to drive him out of the basement apartment where he's only paying $450 a month. This is under the city's rent stabilized laws, all right? The median rent in the the gentrifying Brooklyn neighborhood is now $3,000 a month. That's your median, that's your average, okay? He's paying 450 bucks. Since Aaron Ackerberry 
36, moved into the building in June. He has been playing live music 24 seven, according to Robert's neighbor, Maria Flores. Akaberry and his drug addicted associates have broken into Robert's apartment and station overflowing portable bathrooms. Makeshift tents, trash, a smoking barbecue grill and drug paraphernalia by his door, Roberts complains. Every time police or neighbors remove the items, Ackerberry and the squatters move them closer to his door, according to a lawsuit filed against Roberts, landlord and the city's department housing of preservation and development. Now you gotta be very thoughtful about how you contextualize a story like this. Because many, and I've seen this on social media, many are just simply taking sides. Let me provide a little more context and nuance. What the landlord is doing based on the accusation, the landlord is taking two variations of what we would consider to be societal dysfunctions predicated on adverse policies and playing them against each other. It is no crime, it should never be criminalized to be poor, to be homeless. Those are not personal failures, those are policy failures. They're taking this desperation and imploding it on itself so that individuals like the elderly man we're talking about will move, okay? So that more profit can be made. There's more to this story. They have also locked this same elderly man out of his own home, broken his locks, broken his doors, let a pit bull and chickens roam free in front of his unit. The landlord has also failed to fix the deteriorating building that was deemed so dilapidated that it was under a court ordered management by the city for buildings in dire condition. This is criminal, this is heartless, Robert said in a news release. Let's go to Brooklyn Legal Services, all right? They're supposed to handle things like this. Tenant Rights Coalition filed the suit on behalf of Roberts adding the corporate owner's officer and the property manager to the in the filing on November 17th. They are demanding that the landlord at 972 Park Place LLC correct 240 violations in the building and stop the harassment. There's also a green substance leaking, leaking in Roberts kitchen ceiling that he believes could be toxic and sewage is backing up in his sink. His unit has faulty electrical wiring, holes in the floors and walls and other structural issues. They were problematic. There's also mold growing from a defective sewage system. Man, he's 77 years old. Put up the picture. Ackerberry allegedly created this makeshift tent and portable bathrooms, plural, directly in front of the residence of the elderly 77 year old Mr. Roberts. Roberts is one of the thousands black individuals, elderly New Yorkers targeted for displacement by deplorable living conditions to turn a profit Brooklyn Legal Services said once a a majority black owned or black neighborhood and black owned property, Crown Heights black population declined by 18,750 people between 2010 and 2020. The US Census shows dozens of Crown Heights residents and community groups have now rallied behind Roberts to tackle the issue, relaunching a block association to protect their elderly neighbor. Let's put up the picture of his neighbors. Now, I want you to look at this picture. At some point, things got okay. It was not bad, maybe not great, but not bad in that community. And they no longer had the same association, connection, relationships. Then all of a sudden, Mr. Roberts, he has this dire circumstance. He's being treated unfairly, he's being treated criminally in my opinion. And the neighborhood comes back together. Roberts and other neighbors actually talked to the police about Ackerberry holding cell phone to his head. Who has been allegedly harassing Mr. Roberts and selling drugs in their apartment building according to 
the report. There was a block association here for decades that has been dormant for years because of displacement. But neighbors remember all of those years of neighbors protecting neighbors, raising each other's children, celebrating together, which created the block that we have today. Ari Brostoff of the Crown Heights Tenant Union said, some want the landlord to face charges and a new owner to take over the building and fix it. All right, I wanna say this because I'm sure somebody in the community will get the segment when we post it on social media later. Don't let this landlord play you against each other. There's a significant connection between the reality of adverse policy and the fact that this landlord knows exactly what carrot to dangle in order to create the chaos he's creating. Don't fall for it, you're stronger together, you're unified right now, keep that. Because the tactics of this particular landlord based on the allegation is not only immoral, it's criminal. Mr. Roberts has lived too damn long to live like this. Thank you, everyone who has stepped up. We will continue to highlight this and bring you updates as it develops. Ricky, thoughts here? Yeah, um, uh, we have to de- thank you again for this opportunity. We have to definitely always remember to protect uh, women and children and protect the elderly. Uh, I am a grandson of grandparents. I take this uh, really, really personal. Uh, one lesson out of this is all money is not good money. Yep. And and people like that, just because you have money, uh, you, you know, you have to do the right thing. Uh, that that is a father, that is a grandfather. Uh, he is something to somebody. And just because you know people don't have what you have, that don't mean that you mistreat people and throw them away. And one thing we must always remember: if you grew up in a Baptist church like I did, or whatever, keep living. Because as you age and as you get older, you don't know who's gonna have to wipe you or who's gonna have to hand you a glass of water. You know where you've been, but you don't know where you're going. And if you keep living, you're gonna be elderly someday. And hopefully that God have his grace on you that nobody would treat you like you're treating him. So we have to be mindful of stuff like that when you're dealing with women, children, the elderly and the home. And uh, so we just pray for him. And I just hope that everybody put their arms around the man uh, and help him and get that landlord. Uh, if he broken any laws, he should be prosecuted and put in jail and anybody involved in that uh, as well. Very well said. Yeah. Very well said. We're gonna stay on top of this story. All right, um, let's put their pictures up. These individuals committed a heinous crime. All right, they said, we're gonna robocall a bunch of black folk. We're gonna tell these black people that they have uh, possibly a warrant for their arrest without saying it directly. Uh, That if they vote, they may actually be forced to take a vaccine that they don't want to take. They have now been sentenced. You're looking at Jacob Wohl and Jack Berkman. They were sentenced to two years of electronic monitoring and 500 hours of community service. They have to register voters now after misinforming voters with lies about mail in voting. All right, their community service is that they have to spend their time registering the same people they try to disenfranchise. Let me give you the background to this insanity. The duo robo called about 85,000 voters across Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Ohio. This was in the summer of 2020. Falsely telling those voters that by voting through the mail, you would risk giving your private information to the man. Prosecutors said the pair were targeting neighborhoods known to have a high percentage of black voters. The robocaller, who claimed to be with the non-existent group called the 1599 Project, falsely said that voters information would go into a database accessible to the police. Debt collectors and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention 
would use this information if they voted early, if they voted by mail. They would use the information to impose a vaccine mandate upon them. The caller cited no evidence to support these claims. Look at this. And this is why I say so often to individuals who push back on the voting dynamic, I understand why you don't like the people running. I get that part. But when you say, when you say that somehow voting is not effective, that voting doesn't matter, why do you think they work so hard to keep you from doing it? If it mattered not, they would not engage in tactics like this. There's more. Let me give you background to past antics. Together, this duo, this criminal duo, have failed to frame Robert Mueller, uh, Mueller, Pete Buttigieg, and Dr. Fauci of sexual assault allegations. They staged a phony FBI raid on Berkman's own house, successfully fooling the Washington Post into doing a story. They allegedly stole the phone of a White House liaison. That hoe was dating to tweet out false allegations from her account and then said she'd accused him of kidnapping. What in the hell is wrong with these folks? After they were caught and convicted, here's what happened. Ohio's, uh, the county common uh, pleas court sentenced them to two years probation. Six months of GPS monitoring, they got an ankle bracelet now. $2,500 each in fines and 500 hours of registering voters in Washington DC for their role in the robocalls. The duo is facing felony charges in Michigan, plus lawsuits from various civil rights groups and the state attorney general in New York. The Federal Communications Commission is also considering fining the pair a record breaking 5 million for making the robocalls to cell phones without consent. Have you heard of this story? Have you heard of this? Probably not. Do you think Republicans care? I mean, they're the ones who are passing all of these voter restriction laws claiming it's all about protecting democracy. Have they talked about this story? No, why? Because these individuals fit their ultimate goal, which is to disenfranchise voters of color. So because of that, they will not highlight the reality of their criminal conduct. This is when you realize it's all a game for many elected officials and those that support them. The reality is democracy should be sacred, it should. Now we say that this country is built on the cornerstone of democratic principles, it is not. I hope we actually mature to that place, but the country is actually built on racism, prejudice, the haves and the have nots. The DNA of this country was built on white, Rich folk being able to own black people. That's what it was built on. Be real about that. Can we mature to a better, to a better realization? Yes, of course we can. There's a difference between nature and nurture, but do not dismiss the nature of this nation. But we can nurture it to a different reality. These individuals represent the nature of the country. Those who are now coming against them represent the nurture of where we should be. Ricky, thoughts here? Yeah, that was a nice little slap on the wrist to give them nothing. I'll tell you what, uh, the black ladies that was working, uh, the, the African American election officials yep. that were working in the state of Georgia, I'm sure they would probably love to exchange uh, situations with them or whatever because the way they was harassed and humiliated. Mm -hmm. And they're like threatened, and to see those black ladies up there doing the right thing and, and sitting up there in tears. One had to leave uh, her residence because she was getting death threats from uh, people in Georgia. Uh, you know, during 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 the last election, it's just outright racism, and it's wrong. And that's why we have to be vigilant in protecting voting rights and protecting voting laws. And I, and everybody needs to understand that people have given their lives and made the ultimate sacrifice just where we can have the rights to vote. And you got people just taking advantage of the system. They're not gonna go to jail, they're not gonna do any time or whatever. Only thing they gotta do is when the, the right lose election, they keep moving the goalposts. Now they're trying to make it hard to vote. You got gerrymandering 
uh, going on in every single state and just trying to set it up where we don't have no power and don't have a voice in Congress. So we just have to continue to tell the young people to continue to get out and vote or whatever and understand that people have died just and made the ultimate sacrifice just where we can exercise these rights. So that's my point on that. That, that is such a grand slam statement you just made, Ricky. The sentiment is very simple. Uh, the reality is they are changing the rules as the game yep. progresses. They're changing the rules because they realize they are out of ideas. They are out of yep. solutions. They have absolutely no remedy for the right now challenges of America. So instead of the voter picking the politician, they now want the politicians to pick the voters. That is how they are going to try to control the game moving forward. You already know the plan. Now we have a response. We got more. On the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back, we have a lot of show left. Let me go to some of the comments um, before I do that. Before I do that, let me remind everyone, uh, we have live coverage tonight for the US Senate runoff in the state of Georgia. Um, Raphael Warnock, the current Senator and Republican nominee, um, Herschel Burchill. Find out if Jenk, me, John, we'll call it right, all right? So we're gonna do that tonight. Uh, and listen, go to tyt.com forward slash live, YouTube, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and the linear cable stations, okay? We're gonna bring you that, I think starting at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. All right, got a lot of comments. I will get to as many as I can. I am Sock says, if you vote for Herschel Walker, your credit score should immediately drop 500 points. Damn, all right. <laughs> 500, okay. Uh, Mickey C, the silver haired dragon says, how much do we love that Dr. Richard always uses Herschel's middle name? Damn, exactly, right? I don't know how else to say it. Uh, Eileen, lesbian dance theory dragon. You know Herschel's family is praying that he does not win. That is correct, they are, all right? Stop dragon says, as Ricky said, we must protect the elderly. They are our only true connection to our past selves. This story is a heartbreak, that's correct, 100% agree. All right, uh, Stephanie Haynes, uh, thank you for that Stephanie. Uh, untold amounts of black men have died over false accusations while Herschel is the embodiment of stereotypes and actual scourge of white women and Republicans alike. There's our boy, what is this? There you go. Um, also, thank you, Rich, the Rich Action Show. We appreciate it. Uh, stop it, Dr. Richard. These people aren't ready for actual facts on Walker, LOL. They're not ready for the truth. They are not. But it's coming, though. Ladies and gentlemen, got something for you. I wish a caring would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You must feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Karen, are you there? There it is. Oh, Andy. Now you're going to have to get a new window and everything. Well, at least it's only the windshield. Yeah. She smashed out the van windows, oh, too. Oh, oh, my. oh, she didn't miss the car. She yeah. just lost it. Come in and I made her some popcorn and she just threw it all over the place. Oh, and then she grabbed our pictures and started smashing them off the mirror, the wardrobe mirror. Oh, I'm surprised gosh. it didn't break. Yeah. And that's when I said, I'm bailing. And then she started getting crazy, calling Nancy Pelosi and all them and chewing them out. So she's been intoxicated. She's kind of had some of her prescribed medication along with alcohol tonight. They were a little upset about the election and results. One more thing. Uh, yes, ma'am. If you don't vote red, your children are being indoctrinated to be. Hitler's youth number two. Yeah, I was just and sexually indoctrinated. So you vote red or blue, but if you vote blue, I feel real sorry for you. You all set? You need me to help you? Close that? Okay. Yep. Here we go. Let's put up the picture of the destruction of this Karen. Um, this individual engaged in criminal conduct, and it was, you know, insane. So, a few things here. 
the Karen in question decided to commit vandalism because she did not like the outcome of an election. Understand this now, because of an election, she decided to engage in criminal conduct. Well, what did the officer do? Well, he provided assistance. He was very nice, cordial. It did not make him upset. The fact that the individual was intoxicated did not cause him to say, hey, hey, we're gonna lock you up for a public intoxication. The spirit, the personality, the attitude, completely different. I want you to change variables just for a minute here, okay? Let's say it's not a Karen, let's say it's a black male. Black male is upset over the election. He decides to destroy property. Police come to said location. They see an intoxicated African American male. This African American male opens the door and starts talking directly to the officer about what the cop needs to do with his own life. Do you think the officer turns around and says to the black male, "Hey, listen, can I help you? Like, you know, let me let me come up here and help you out." Yeah. No, of course not. Never has happened. Have you ever seen it before? Never. We routinely see it when you change the individuals. That is all the proof you need to understand either hyper aggressive bias or implicit bias. As I have always said, it doesn't matter which one it is because at the end of it, the impact is the same. Ricky, thoughts on this? Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> preferential treatment yeah. uh, that they get because, yeah, you're absolutely right. If that was me or you, we would be in jail. Uh, somebody invited her in and gave her some hot, buttery, over red and vodka popcorn. <laughs> right. Out there and bust somebody wonder, but I want to just encourage everybody when you have a Karen incident, take your phone out and film immediately yes. because you have to continue to film, embarrass, prosecute, and hold people accountable for their actions. And if she would have broke the windows out of my car, I would have took a jack camera and flipped that trailer over. <laughs> <laughs> Just be thinking about the imagery of that, it makes me chuckle. A Starbucks customer gets the word monkey written on her coffee cup. You see that? Okay. Now, some of you may say, well, that must have been a mistake somewhere. Well, let me give you the background. Maryland woman is speaking out after Starbucks, a Starbucks barista. Wrote her name as Monkey while taking her order. Monique Pugh is the name of the woman who's a loyal Starbucks customer. 20 years. On November 19th, she said she visited the location inside of Maryland. This was a mall and ordered a venti caramel frappuccino. All right. The lady at the register. Requested my name, she said, and I told her. I said, my name is Monique, all right? Uh, she said, noting that she used the Starbucks app to pay and verbally told her the name. Ms. Pugh said it was a long wait for her drink. This was uncommon for her experience. And she observed that everyone ahead of her was already called by their name. So this is now an issue. I can see from a distance a barista picks up my drink. She looks at it, weird, says venti caramel frap and backed away. Pew said she picked up the cup and saw the word monkey on it. My heart just drops, she said. It was one of those in the moment things where your heart just drops and you're like, what? Despite the distressing word on her cup, Miss Pew said, she initially just engaged with the nearest barista who was a male to try to get him to fix her drink, which was made incorrectly. So on top of the monkey word, the drink itself was not properly made. So she wanted a new one. She said that he immediately became combative with her and argumentative. He and I were going back and forth about whether the drink was made correctly. And then I had to stop myself and realize monkey was written on my cup. She said, adding she was the only black person in the store at the time. She said she asked the employee, why am I the only black person in the store and monkey is written on my cup? Ms. Pugh said the male barista shrugged and told her mm, it was a mistake. 
Just with that attitude and his response, it's triggering. And I can understand her point. Customers were looking at me and I was embarrassed. A Starbucks corporate representative confirmed the incident did in fact happen. And told today.com the employee who took the order has now been suspended. They also said the store where the incident happened was a franchise owned store by the company called Impeccable Brands. Impeccable Brands has said they're launching an investigation. Sharon thoughts on this case. They get my order wrong every day. And I still go back and pay yeah. for this overpriced coffee. It's time to make the donuts go elsewhere, perhaps until they can really make sure things like this don't happen. Suspended. Yeah. Put a monkey on the cup and argue with the customer. Come on, no. exactly. Yeah, I agree 100%. Suspension, wait, that's no. That, that person needs to go ahead and go. This is a life lesson. All right, I got something for everybody. Double dose. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You're going to feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. There's some <laughs> working here that are legal. Yes, sir. He's calling the sheriff right now. Call the immigration. Yes, please. There's one, two, three ladies that don't have papers. Yes, sir. I swear to God, I'm an American citizen. I want to be in Nam and I want you to know Guerra. Yes, sir. I'm going to wait outside. Call the immigration. Please. He's calling the sheriffs. I'm calling the immigration. What does this come from? Where? Let's put up his picture, full of mass. Interesting. His shirt says encourager. You see that? And there's an arrow that points to him. Uh, individuals should never have to face this kind of rhetoric. And I'm gonna say this because I think sometimes we see a situation like what you just witnessed. And we will, at least if you're decent, we will say, you know, that's bad. That person shouldn't do that. Uh, this is wrong. But there's another side of it as well. The people who are victims of this kind of abuse, even if they don't show it in the moment, it impacts them. They keep it. And nobody should have to be subject to this kind of treatment, embarrassment. But the genesis of it is rooted in hate, is rooted and evil is rooted in supremacy. They think they're better than others. Why is it so difficult to simply be okay with the differences of another human being? You do realize the way a person is born is so innate to who they are. If you are a person of faith like myself, you understand that that is a divine dynamic. If you're not a person of faith, you understand it is a natural dynamic. Nobody should be blamed for how they came into this world. Ricky, thoughts here? Yeah, I've seen this behavior before. Uh, I was at a restaurant getting some donuts, and I saw a man talking to a, uh, a black woman like that. Mm. And I looked her in the eyes, and I stood firm. I went in front of that register and told her to be encouraged and told yes. her what a beautiful queen she was. Yes. And told but, and, and I'm talking about and made sure because I, I, I was saying it to provoke him to say something to bring some of that energy to mm -hmm, me. Right. You, know, you get people like that that think that you're supposed to serve them and uh, they're entitled and they don't get enough ketchup or their food uh, right when they want it or an extra Cajun sparkle or whatever it may be. This type of behavior uh, that you're gonna get. But again, I say you have to continue to film, yeah. turn, put the phone in their face, embarrass them and make sure that they have consequences to the action. Just like, oh, you know, I can go on and on because just like the man that was bullying the young man outside and then he woke up the next morning with a yard full of black folks telling them to come on outside. Right. And we just not taking it no more. It's not the 20s, the 30s and the 40s and 50s and the 60s. We're just not taking it anymore. And uh, that kind of behavior uh, needs to be met with some um, 
you know, some repercussion. And I'm not talking about speaking of violence or whatever, but some consequence, a slap on the wrist, a get in your face. Challenge people like that and let people know that that behavior is not okay. If you see something, say something and film every single time. Every single time, and that's the only way we can provide a mirror in this culture. Dr. King employed that strategy, as you are well aware. That was part of the civil rights strategy. I teach a class at the university called Dr. King as a change agent, and we explore his methodology. He wanted cameras to be there. He needed to expose the extreme violence visited upon not only black folk, but individuals who supported them who happened not to be black. He needed the world to see this, so that was part of the mirror required to create change. And another gem you just dropped, and I want people to get this cuz it, it really struck me in a powerful way. You went and encouraged the person who was insulted. That's powerful because you don't have to necessarily go after the person doing the insult. You don't have to, you can literally come to the person who has been a victim of this yes. and build them up. You can build them up and that's what you did right. and I like that, a lot of wisdom there. All right, we got more on the other side, it's indisputable stick and stay. Welcome back, very sad story, we covered it when it first happened. Now, a grand jury has agreed with us that cops actually committed homicide. Let me remind you of the situation as it unfolded, here it is. Drop the knife! Oh, please drop the knife! Oh, Lord. Lord. Randy, you got that door held shut? Oh, he went for you, William, right? He's straight in his throat. God damn it, no! No! Go get my medical bag, out of the kit! Drop it, Chris! Oh my God! What do we do? Get that knife! He dropped it. Open the door. Get the knife out. Unlock the, the door. Unlock the door. Where's my baton? Okay. okay, come on, Christian. Come on, Scott. Come on, Christian. Yeah. Put up his picture. And I want to explain something, okay? I get emotional because I decided not to train myself to be desensitized to these stories. <laughs> um, when I started my broadcast career, that was a requirement, and I refused to do so. This 22 year old young man was suffering a mental health crisis. It was clear he was suffering a mental health crisis. When we first covered this, I said on that day, this was homicide. Now a grand jury has finally indicted these cops. Christian Glass, 22 years of age, got his car stuck on a rural road in Colorado. You see, he's making a heart symbol because in his mind, he's trying to let them know he's no danger to anybody, loves them. But he's in a chaotic state mentally, posed no threat. He was just sitting in his car, they could have left him alone. They could have just sat down and waited. The man is gonna end up getting hungry, falling asleep, it's a human being. You can't just wait for your shift to end, just wait and he'll be alive. But they couldn't do that. <laughs> Let's put his picture back up. This human being, this person that should be alive today, actually is the one who called 911. He called 911 because he wanted help to get his vehicle unstuck, but on the call, he clearly was going through a mental health crisis. He was paranoid on the telephone to 911. He was extremely afraid according to the call he made 
to 911. When officers arrived, body camera video showed Glass refusing to exit the car while telling officers he was in fact terrified and making heart shaped um, signals or signs with his hands. The grand jury decided that two Colorado sheriff deputies needlessly escalated a fatal standoff with Glass who was experiencing a mental health crisis leading him to brandish a knife in a state of complete panic and self defense. Indictments released last Monday showed. Let's put up the pictures that we have of this person, okay? According to the details, Clear Creek County Sheriff Deputy Andrew Bowen, who shot glass, oscillated between aggressive language and then conversational tone with the paranoid young man and then decided to mute his body camera when speaking to the supervisor, Deputy Kyle Gould, just before the situation escalated. Understand what I'm saying, understand what I'm saying. He goes back and forth with this individual who's clearly mentally unstable, going through a mental health crisis. He's using a variation of tone. In one moment, he seems okay, the cop. The next moment, he seems as if he wants to do something really bad to this young man. It's confusing the young man, even more so. Then he goes to his supervisor, cuts off his microphone, comes back and kills him. What do you think he said? Do you think he may have said he's gonna go ahead and do exactly what he did? We don't know, he cut his microphone off. All right, um, Bowen was indicted, rightfully so, on charges of second degree murder, official misconduct and reckless endangerment. The indictment was announced last week, months after Glass's death. But the details were only made public with last month's release. Gold who was not at the scene, was indicted on charges of reckless endangerment and criminally negligent homicide. You See that, look at him. The indictment claims it was after the call that Bowen told another officer at the scene, the decision to forcefully remove glass from the vehicle had been made. The decision to breach the car came without a determination that was probable cause or a reasonable suspicion by officers on the scene that a crime had been or was being committed according to the indictment. No crime had been committed whatsoever, right? Nicole Lentz, a spokesperson for the Clear Creek County Sheriff said in a statement that both officers were terminated following the indictments. The sheriff's office ongoing internal investigation found policy and procedural failures. Adding that the office's initial news release following the shooting does not reflect the entirety of what happened on that terrible night. In other words, the news release was a lie. The grand jury alleged that at no point was the officer in imminent danger. That is the requirement to use deadly force. But for the decision by Gould to remove Mr. Glass from the vehicle, there is no reason to believe that Mr. Glass would have been a danger to any law enforcement personnel, to himself or to any member of the public, the grand jury wrote. And the decision to remove him from the vehicle directly led to the death of Mr. Glass. Now I want you to remember our first day reporting this, that's almost verbatim what we said. There was no reason to even remove him from the car. He committed no crime. Finally, the wheels of justice are moving in the right direction. We're gonna continue to stay with this story that young 22 year old brother should be alive. And I call him my brother because he is an expression of my values, he did nothing wrong. All right, Ricky, thoughts here? Yeah, um, I'm scared to call the police. If I, if, if, if we, if, if we drive between Birmingham and Atlanta all the time, yeah. If if, if, if our car break down, who are we gonna call? Right. Because because that can mean the same thing for us. You, you know what I'm saying? You got a cop that's uh, hyper, non-caring, aggressive, itching to shoot. 
can't wait to shoot, want to shoot, giving confusing orders like we've seen before. We've seen cops kill a lot of people giving aggressive, confusing orders, and people think they're gonna die and they panic. And then all of a sudden, you all you you load off seven round, and that that cop knew he was gonna shoot him when he uh, muted. And why would you mute that? That's uh, right. The camera. Uh, to begin with, or whatever, and they should put him in jail. But not only him, they should put a lot of them should be in jail. You know, the the, the cop that killed Breonna Taylor, and I can go on and on and on, should be in jail or whatever. And let's see if the fraternal order of police gonna release mm. us about that. Come on, you see that part, that yeah. part right there. All right, another. Very sad story of a principal, a school principal, took his own life because of false accusations, as far as we can tell, based on the report. Let's put up his picture. This is a very sad story, okay? This was in Anaheim, California. An elementary school principal jumped to his death from a seven story parking garage at Disneyland. Christopher Christensen, a 51 year old principal and musician from Westminster jumped to his own death on Saturday night. Now when I tell you the why, it is going to make you very sad. According to Orange County Superior Court records, the principal was facing misdemeanor charges of child endangerment and violence at the time of his death. On the evening of his passing, Mr. Christensen posted a message to Facebook stating in part, and I quote, I hate when people leave this earth with so many unanswered questions. So I hope this provides some insight and perspective. The post mentioned an argument with his wife. I'm gonna read the exact quote connected to that part of his proclamation. Unfortunately, two weeks ago, she and I got into a heated argument at home in front of the girls. Tempers were flared and strong words were exchanged between us. However, never in this exchange did I hit, slap, or hurt Marlena. In any manner, nor did I ever touch the girls. I never have and never will. I love the girls like my own. They know that, as does everyone who truly knows me. Unfortunately, Marlena's anger got the best of her that night, and she called the police, which landed me in jail that night. Yes, me, a man who has never hit or harmed anyone in his life. Then he talked about the flawed legal system. He wrote that the recent November evening completely unraveled his and his wife's lives. He said he had been placed on administrative leave and was on the brink of losing his job in Newland Elementary. And his case made its way through the legal system, which he described as extremely flawed, especially against men and fathers. He said his wife had no intention of the night escalating the way it did, regrets making the call to the police. She was also trying to, and this is a quote, clear my name with little success. So here I am writing my final Facebook post to all of you. I need you all to know that a gentle, kind, loving and sincerely good man has been destroyed by one unfortunate night. I really, it really is unfortunate. This is not me, this is not something I ever thought would happen to me. Near the end of the post, he professes his love for being an educator and a musician. That he was going to reach out to those closest to him to tell them how much he loved them. His post ended with these last words, take care everyone. Please, please be kind to one another. Treat each other with kindness and grace. There is too much anger in the world and people need to start treating each other better. What I've shared with you above is a prime example of how anger 
can really have a long lasting and extremely damaging effect on a person's life. Um, let's put up a picture of him having fun, okay? Uh, Mr. Christensen, also known as Mr. C, worked for the Fountain Valley School District for 22 years. According to the LA Times, at least three others have actually jumped to their deaths from the seven story structure at Disneyland. A 61 year old man in 2010, a 23 year old man in 2012, and a 40 year old man in 2016. Listen, I highlight this story because uh, many of us have been there. We don't talk about it, it's taboo to discuss it. If anyone is feeling that kind of stress, you can always dial 988. The crisis center provides free, confidential, emotional support 24 hours a day, seven days a week to civilians and veterans. If you need help, dial those three numbers, dial them. Um, this was so sad, um, Ricky, there's some more to this story. But it does look as if there was an allegation that was not true against them. They were working to clear it and it was not happening fast enough. Compared to the punishment he was experiencing not only through the legal system, but also through um, a job he loved a lot. Um, very unfortunate, uh, obviously. Um, sending positive energy and prayers to those um, who love him, who are friends with him. Uh, but we want to make sure we take a moment to highlight the reality that this happens in the culture, but it doesn't have to. There's opportunity, opportunity to connect with somebody that can probably talk to you for long enough so that your better angels can overcome. Ricky, thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, so often, um, you, you know, 911 is, is for people that really need the help. And then you have a lot of people that abuse the system, uh, just using 911 because they're angry when they wasn't attacked or anything like that. Yeah. People work hard to get through college, to educate themselves, to become a profession, been in this profession for a long time. And uh, everybody can't handle walking into the school or walking into a situation being judged by everyone when you work so hard to uh, to be the best that you can. And uh, you, you know, uh, if you don't have a certain level of uh, strength and can handle something like that or whatever, you know, then, then to some people the option is suicide. And that's really sad and unfortunate. I hate that he took his life. I wish he had dialed 988, which you encourage people to dial if they ever feel in that way. But uh, that's a real sad situation. And we need everyone to save those 911 calls for, for if there's a real uh, emergency and don't abuse the court system. Because you go in there, everybody hates you. It's assume that you know, you did something wrong or whatever, you're, you're, you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And even after you prove yourself innocent, hell, you still got your reputation and yep. just the thought and the aura of that you had a situation that you could have done. It. And you, you still walk around thinking that you know, people think that you did it and it just does something to you mentally. Uh, you know, and I just couldn't imagine how he felt. Yeah, all right, we got more. On the other side, it's indisputable stick and stay. All right, I really appreciate everyone for remaining with the show. Tough stories, tough stories today. And I reminded, no matter how tough a story is, the person who had to go through it had the worst of it all. So they deserve a voice. All right, so we become that, you become that as well. We have an exclusive a school teacher, a math teacher threatens a student with physical violence. We have the video, we have the background, we have the information. Let me take you to the video now. Here it is. All right, 
The teacher said, this B word will beat your up. Now, teachers, educators are to be professional regardless of the situation. I have been a high school teacher myself. I'm a college professor today. Professionalism is not for individuals who are always professional with you. It's for people who may not be. That's the reason professionalism is required, right? These are children. You do not talk to them this way. You do not threaten them in this manner. All right, uh, Leesburg High School, let's put it up. A Florida math teacher, yes, state of Florida in Leesburg and Leesburg High School threatened his freshman student after kicking him out of the class. Amir Davis says he was thrown out of the room after asking his classmate for a pencil during class. Um, here's Amir Davis, the freshman who was thrown out, all right? He's the one that experienced this. In the classroom, I was looking for a pencil because I didn't have one or no one else did. And the teacher was yelling at me to sit down and do my work. And I'm trying to tell him that I don't have a pencil at all. He started cussing me out and told me to get out. And then whenever I was walking through the door, he told me I'll beat your ass. Here is Leesburg High School principal Michael Randolph, right? When Amir's parents visited the principal, to discuss the altercation, the principal called the school resource officer. Officer Edwards cited the child's mother, Cherokee Rays, with wiretapping. Listen to me now. Cited the child's mother with wiretapping and with tampering with evidence when she refused to give up her cell phone. You're looking at it. That's it. That's what the officer did, there's more. Under Florida statute, Cherokee Rays was cited 93403, interception and disclosure of oral communications prohibited. However, Rays says she never disclosed the recording to anyone, including indisputable. She says she put a phone in front of the principal on his desk to record and said she was recording. The parents also stressed the meeting was not private. The door to the office was opened and several people came in and out of the room during their conversation. The 15 year old Amir Davis also says he was later approached by a vice principal who lied to him saying his parents had granted the man permission to see Amir's phone. Davis's parents say, I say they had explicitly denied the vice principal's request. They wanted to talk about grades and this and that, but not the teacher. It's pretty serious. I just wanted the teacher to have consequences for his actions. I was just very upset. I felt like nothing was getting done in the meeting. The school did not announce any reprimand for the teacher. Um, Donovan Henry is the name. In 2018, Henry was suspended for a separate violation, all right? So listen, here's what happens. When you all play these games, I have a research team that has an equal game for you. So let's go to the background of the educator since you decided not to do anything. Um, state education investigators found what? The same school teacher, Mr. Donovan Henry did not follow the rules while administering the SAT for nearly 30 high school students. And as a result, those student scores were found to be completely 100% invalid, invalid. You know how tough it is to study for the SATs, all right? Henry, a math teacher at the school was put on one year suspension by the Education Practices Commission of the state of Florida and fined $750. A representative of the school has not reached back out for comment as of this moment. Let me make it very clear, okay? These are not grown people, these are children. If you do not like how something is going down in your classroom, you lead by example. You do not act as if you're gonna take a child outside and beat them up. And for you to have no penalty and for the rest of this, 
reality for the student and the parents to be what it is, it is utterly insane. But it's okay, we are able to create some equity in this situation through exposure. Ricky, thoughts here. Hey, I just want to, um, you know, harassing that student like that was just um, wrong. It was disrespectful, um, and you know, it could have gotten worse, especially yeah. with a resource officer in the school in the state of Florida, yeah. where they they are very impatient with uh, children of color and quick to to draw a gun or pull out handcuffs, slam them to the ground or whatever. It could have went all the way to left, uh, uh, and and then they try to play these games. And play politics, but the best thing, you know, I want to tell all parents: tell your kids for their safety, because we're dealing with with craziness in the schools and in the police departments. Whatever the teacher asks you to do, record it, do it, stay silent, keep your mouth shut, and 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 that's it. And then try to make it home to tell your story. Because the situation escalate in that classroom with that resource officer, and there's nobody there to protect you, and anything could have happened. It could have been way worse. Yeah, we got more on the other side. Indisputable stick and stay. Welcome back. All right, a predator cop has now been convicted of rape. 50 years is the sentence. We covered this when it first happened. Let's put this picture up full mass here. During that original coverage, I said I would not be surprised if this cop hasn't done it before, talking about the sexual assault. Well, guess what? It turned out to be true. Former Atlanta police officer Lionel Daly, 33 years of age, who was labeled a serial rapist. By Cherokee County prosecutors during his trial was found guilty, multiple charges, and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Uh, so this cop, right? He was a cop at the time, was indicted in May, was found guilty of raping a woman in her Ackworth home. Let me show you how diabolical this was. This cop used his position as a police officer to intimidate the victim, coerce her into letting the assault go unreported, according to the DA, Shannon Wallace. Let's put up a picture of the DA. Uh, this DA was serious about prosecuting the cop from day one. From day one, they were serious about doing this. Uh, according to Wallace, the victim ran a massage business out of her home and the cop contacted her about being a new client. During the January 31st appointment, the cop showed the victim his badge about halfway through the massage and said he was conducting an investigation and then engaged in the sexual assault. There was no investigation. Because he was an officer, the victim feared repercussions if she reported the incident. Wallace said, a friend eventually convinced her, call 911. A few days later, then the investigation was open. Investigators found that this cop sexually assaulted at least three other victims outside of Cherokee. Though the cop was not charged in those cases, every single one of those victims testified in open trial. Police previously told the Atlanta Journal Constitution that the officer Daly was not working on official business at the time of the assault. He turned himself in. This was in February, all right? After the victim reported the assault, he was immediately fired. He was convicted by a Cherokee jury on one count of each violation and violation of oath of office. Court documents show on Wednesday, he was handed the 50 year sentence following life on probation. Um, insane, evil, horrible, but he's off the streets. Why? Because one person said, we're gonna call 911. He likely saved a whole lot of other victims in his future. All right, Ricky, thoughts here. Hey, uh, it's important to do background checks before we hire these people to become police officers. And um, I, I just really hate that, and I'm glad that it got 50 years. Justice well served. There it is. My dear brother, always a pleasure having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you. Check out all of your amazing work across the planet. Thank you. All right. How can people check you out, Ricky? Where can they go? And you can follow me at Ricky Smiley Official, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.